Hi booktube, welcome to Jackie's Literary Corner. I am Jackie and today I'm going to do a tag video. I saw, um, as I'm filming this, I had saw Jennifer Brooks do this tag last night, the night before, and I'm going, I thought I would do it because I've, lately I've been having trouble with tags and finding answers and coming up with answers for some of the questions on tags I thought were really interesting. Um, so this one sounded a little bit easier and easier still fun and something I could talk about and discuss my answers um and just think about what I want to say so I will post the link to in the description box below about who created this tag so you guys know how this works um there's a series of questions although in this case it's a series of prompts I have to answer and they're prompts that you have to decide if it's in or out and the way Jennifer Brooks did it, I feel like she was like, well, some of the things were in for her, but for other people, for the book public, they were, they might have been out or vice versa. So I'm going to probably think along those lines. Okay, so first, number one is reading the last page, the last page first. And this is one that requires a little bit of an explanation okay so first off I'm I have no problem with getting spoiled like when it even when, like when it came to TV shows I will let my get myself get spoiled I would look up spoilers in fact there was one show in particular that I that really that I just had to get spoiled for um but what I do is I don't read the last page first but I will establish reading the book reading a lot of it and then if there's something in the story like a romance plot point or like a real other another really like a friendship plot point or something else for something I'm so character sometimes I want to make sure everything's okay with that so I will let myself get spoiled because I don't have a problem I personally think you can still enjoy a story even if you know what's gonna happen I mean it's the whole adage of it's the journey not the destination like, I feel like you can still enjoy the journey, even if you know where it's going to end up. Um, and sometimes you need to know where it's going to end up because, like, it's, you know, for your own emotions, sometimes it's better to at least you can be able to relax and not feel tense while reading the book all the time. Now, some people like the tent, the feeling of t intensity. And there was a time when I would definitely been like, Oh, I don't want to know. I don't want to get spoiled. But as I've gone in over the years, I've like, okay, I just need to get spoiled. I just need to know how things are going to turn out. So I don't technically, I don't read it first. And I won't judge people if they do read the last page first. Although it was, there was a movie I remember where a character would do that. And her love interest, although she wasn't the main character, so I guess she was the love interest. The love interest would read the last page first before she bought the book. And the guy would just get, got really annoyed and was like, but don't, don't, don't read that. And I think it's all, but I think she's thinking, no, if I'm going to spend some money on this book, then I want to know if I'm going to like how it turns out. So, or, she's a good argument, you know, I mean. But yeah, I thought that was, that was funny. That, um, but yeah, if you want to read the last page first, who am I to judge you for that? You know, I do it anyway. I do it myself or not first, but I sort of do the same thing. So, okay. So question number two, enemies to lovers. And this is one of those things where I think it's a cool idea. I don't read a lot of it and I'm not, you know, I don't read the romance novels where there's a enemies to lovers, but I always find it intriguing. I find the, the idea really interesting and really cool. The idea of. And I think, and I can understand why it can be kind of fun and, you know, really in, sexy in a way to read uh, two people, like, that are just drawn to each other and are into each other. And so, uh, I mean, I think I probably watch that more than read it. Read books where that happens. Like, I've seen, you know, like, one of my favorite couples is Buffy and Spike on um on you know on um Buffy the Vampire Slayer and don't let and if you watch the show please do not lecture me please do not lecture me on the whole like 
what Spike does in season six. I'm well aware that I know I'm not ignoring it. Okay, I wish it didn't happen, but I acknowledge it happened and it's disturbing. Okay, but I should be allowed to enjoy a couple without feeling like, oh, I can't enjoy this couple anymore because oh, this character crossed the line. You know, I think this is a situation, it's a fictional couple and you can still have, you know, but I acknowledge what happened, okay? I'm not ignoring it. But anyway, so, and then next, dream sequences and number three is, oh, well, I guess any lover to other lovers can be in, like, because I think it's a cool idea. Um, dream sequence, I don't, I feel like this doesn't necessarily work in a book because you're, it's being described to you and it's one of these things where I have to see it, like not just in my own mind, but actually an actual tangible visual, like in a movie or a TV show. Um, so this is, I guess in a way it's out for me because I need to actually seen it now i won't read books that you know obviously i'm gonna read books that have dream sequences like in prophecies and all that you know i'll still read them just because something's out does not mean you won't ever i won't ever read something a book that has that stuff in it because that's just one aspect of the book okay so that's but it's out um love triangles I actually like, like love triangles. I get why people don't like them. Although, funnily enough, I think, like, I know that, you know, my friend Terry, her issue with love triangles isn't because, like, they're old and tiresome. It's, it's more for, like, she, the characters doesn't necessarily get with the guy that she wants them to get with. Um, and I get it, you know, it's disappointing when you are rooting for a character, but for me, that doesn't stop me from being int intrigued by love triangle. Love triangles are kind of fun, you know? And, and it's an easy way to create drama. And that's, like, that's not the one that bothers me the most. The trope that bothers me the most is the amnesia plot. That's the one I despise, and that's the one that I am not comfortable when it's in the story. I mean, if it's done in a lighthearted, funny way, then I might be more tolerant of it. But if it's done really seriously and it's dragged out, then, yeah, I have a problem for it with it and I just can't watch it it's just I, I'm not comfortable with it but anyway love triangles are in for me I think love triangles are fun and very and can be very entertaining especially the awkward especially there can be some awkward scenes in love with when it comes to love triangles that are really funny I mean I roll my eyes of course when there are scenes where the girl our main character and she has two guys that are really hot that are after her and I do have preferences that's like you're complaining why are you complaining you have these two really great guys you know, why are you complaining? You know, although I guess because she has to choose between the two guys. Um. But, anyway, so love triangles are in. Cracked spines are in. Except for, if it gets to the point where I've cracked it so much. If I've cracked it so much that the book has, like, the binding is coming off of it because I have a few books where I've had to tape, tape it a little bit. I mean, I haven't, and I have been tempted to get buy new copies, like my copy of War and Peace, which is the Penguin Black Spine Edition, the paperback one, and I've already, it's already being ripped at the bottom, and I, I don't. <laughs> And I have been very much tempted to buy another copy of it. But at the same time, it's like, but I kind of like the Penguin, a huge Penguin Black Spines collection. I like having those. Granted, that's just one book, but I kind of, you know, it's kind of hard for me to get rid of it, you know. Although I have gotten rid of East of Eden, my copy of East of Eden, and bought the Centennial Anniversary Edition from years ago. Because I like, I really love those editions of Steinbeck's work. But, yeah, I still have an... I, I keep thinking about it every time I go to the bookstore. Um, I keep thinking about replacing War and Peace with another one. But, um... It's, like, I've taped it, so... 
I'm keeping it at least for now. I might change my mind one day, but um, and then I have my Harry Potter book three, Prisoner of Azkaban. I would always read my favorite chapter in that book, and then it, now it's gotten to the point where it actually comes out of the hard encasing of the binding. It is actually the pages have come out. Um, and I was, I have thought about buying, that's another one I thought about buying a paperback copy of it. I mean, maybe like, maybe one day I'll buy, um, if my nephews and or niece ever get into their Potter books, maybe I'll buy myself a copy of the third book or like switch it, you know, cause I, I don't want to entirely get rid of my, my copies because they were first, you know, first edition American editions, the hardback ones, and I, you know, I, like, I don't want to get rid of them, because they were my first series fantasy books, but, um, and then I, the only time we've actually taken the time to, and, um, replace a book, because, well, actually, I didn't even replace the book, but I got rid of, I threw away my copy of, um, my copy of um, the old curiosity shop because the whole book was falling apart and it was a th now it was a third book's purchase but so far that's the only time where a third book purchase has like was bad had gone bad okay that I have never since then I've never that's the only time ever when third book's purchase I think it was third book's although don't take my word because I could have I might have even bought it at the Rosal bookshop I'm not 100% on sure on that but I'm pretty sure it was a thrift books purchase. And if it was, that's the only time it's ever, like, fallen apart that much. And maybe it was because I got a really bad copy. And, you know, I feel like you can't really, you know, critique thrift books for, you know, yeah, maybe you can complain if they don't cooperate, if they're, like, when you message them. If they don't cooperate, maybe you can critique, critique that. But... Feeling like yeah, it's not fair to critique crit, crit, critique the rift books if you don't get the edition that you want because they're dirt cheap, and um, it's a used bookstore, so you might not get the exact one. I mean, granted, I got nervous. I've been nervous a couple times when I wanted a certain edition of a classic. Then yeah, well, I think that's happened to me twice where I've gotten really nervous. But so far, I've had a great experience except for the, this one time with the old Curiosity Shop. I got rid of it, but I ended up getting it for $1.99 um, at my audiobooks purchase site on my phone. I ended up, because it was really cheap. It was a cheap edition, so I got that one, an audiobook, and then just got rid of my copy. Because I wasn't going to pass it on to, you know, my used bookstore, because it's not in good condition. It was falling apart. Like, several pages were coming out. So, it wasn't... So that wouldn't be right to me. So I just threw it away. So long story short, if spine, I like, I mean, cracked spines are in for me, but if they're cracked so cracked, if I let them get so cracked that they come out of their binding, then, and it's completely ruins the book, then yeah, that's, that's a no. That's, that's an out. But for me, mostly cracked spines are in. Because it shows that they're well loved and well read. Okay, so let's see. All right, then we have. Okay, so number six is back to a small town. Is it either in or out? And this one was this. I didn't think about this one because I don't read a lot of like where you see this kind of trope. I don't read a lot of books like that. Um. And I've, I've tried to, and I like, again, this is another one where I like the concept of it. I think it is, it would be really interesting, but I don't read a lot of books that are about that. So it's not entirely, it's not out, but I don't read. So I think, but I think a lot of people really love that concept of going back to your small town, especially anyone who's fans of, you know, I know there's books like Sharp Objects. There's, um, there was Mark Russo, I think it's Russo, um, Richard Russo, he did, um, Empire Falls, which had that, and I was for a while interested in that book, and I have, um, and I did, I actually did consider buying them, but I don't remember if I actually bought it, 
Well, actually, no, I, I have it over there. And that was kind of that type of plot. Um, and like I said, I think the idea... So again, it's not out per se, but I don't read... I'm not an active reader of that kind of plot. So it's not out in, as in it's a bad idea. It's out as in I don't read that kind of stuff. But it is an interesting concept. So, uh, monsters are regular people. This is one of those ones where it depends. Um, because I am so, I love the idea of it being supernatural. You know, and it bugs me when it turns out, oh, actually it's not supernatural. Like, I don't, I'm not a big Scooby-Doo, that whole concept of, oh, it's just a man in a mask or a woman in a mask. I don't. To me, I don't like that. I want it to be a real monster. <laughs> like, which, it's funny that they did a Scooby-Doo episode, like, um, they had a Supernatural episode where the two brothers end up in a Scooby-Doo episode, and it actually, they, um, it's, of course, because the Supernatural is real, like, the, the monster is real. And, of course, in Sco the Scooby-Doo universe, it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be just a person in a mask. So, they had to set it up. So, by the end of it, you know, are they trying to explain to the gang, the Scooby, the, you know, the Scooby gang? And Sam and Dean trying to explain to them that it, it, their monsters are real and they are probably are dealing with the real thing. And, like, Velma is all, oh, that's not logical. There's no way. And the other characters are terrified and, um... And then finally they proved, I think they do prove to her in the episode that it's real, but then they have to take it back at the end because they, they know it really affects those characters in a bad way. It traumatizes them. So because Sam and Dean feel really bad, they end up setting it up where it looks like, oh no, it's still, it's fake. We were wrong. Um, so that was, I thought that was cute. As even though I'm not, I don't watch Scooby-Doo, I'm familiar with it, obviously. So, but yeah, this is out for me because I don't, and I also don't actively read story. I mean, I like the idea of characters that psychologically are damaged. <laughs> like I love Gotham, for instance, you know, Batman's story and particularly Gotham TV show and how these characters, they are technically regular people, but they're completely insane. Most of them are, particularly the Joker, although I don't read the comics. Um, but mostly it's out for me. And, and like, unless you're talking, like I said, you know, like a superhero stuff where a lot of times it's not supernatural and there's some, t or like science fiction where the person is just lost themselves and, and you know they've turned themselves into a monster and I think it's partly and I gotta admit it's partly to do with I don't want to read about something that could actually happen in real life there could actually I don't want to read about a real life psycho you know except for you know I'll watch like documentaries and stuff like that but um I rather it be something supernatural so this is out for me monsters are regular people um Unless you're going with what Jennifer Brooks said where she thought maybe they could, this this prompt could be going more metaphorical in saying, oh, real people, like, can be monsters, are monsters too, and they may not be wearing a mask, or they may, oh, they, they might be wearing a mask. Um, they're, they don't have powers or anything like that, or, like, they don't turn into animals, or, um, or they're not shapeshifters or something. But, so, I mean, but mostly it's out for me. I need, like I said, I need it to, I need a supernatural element to my story. Um, no paragraph breaks is out. And this is, makes it so much harder. Although I am reading you, I am going to attempt to read Ulysses. And that's more divided into sections. So I think that counts as no paragraph breaks. And then there's, like... Um, there's other books. Like, I think this one has no paragraph breaks. I think. Well, oh, well, I guess it kind of does have paragraph breaks. But, um, like, if you mean, like, paragraph, if you mean, like, with, um, 
So I don't know if they would count, like, if they're talking like books like Ulysses, because I am going to attempt that book. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attempt it again. Because I like, I feel like there's so much in the plot um, that I feel like would still be very intriguing and, and f like a fun ride. But like, I don't like stream of consciousness, basically. I don't like stream of consciousness stuff. Oh, and although another thing about Ulysses is he does a lot of different writing styles, I think. James Joyce does in Ulysses. But, um, so I don't know if people would count that as a no paragraph breaks. But, um, like, stream of consciousness is an uh-uh for me. Which, I feel like that has no paragraph breaks. Um, I, I just can't. It's hard for me to read because I need to stop. I need to have a good stopping point and I do not like stopping in the middle of the page. I mean, unless I have to. Like, if I'm at work and I'm reading during my 15 minute break, then yeah, I probably will have to stop in the middle of the page. Um, because, you know, I only get 15 minutes and even then I probably have to end a few minutes earlier. I have to start walking downstairs because I'm in the break room in the back during my break. Or I'm in the parking lot or so I would you know, or I would be in the parking lot probably in a car if I if I could drive. Um so now if I was in like the dining area then yeah, but my I have to I put my bag, my little lunch bag upstairs where the break room is. So I still have to stop early and that means I will have to stop reading a few minutes, like five minutes before my fifty minutes are up. And I have to get back. Although no one, I have been late a little, a little late, like a few minutes late. And so far, no one has ever sent anything to me. Um, like I've never gotten in trouble for it. So in that, in that case, yeah, I might have to stop in the middle of the page. Um, but usually I don't like doing that. So long as paragraph, long as, you know, a page of words that doesn't have paragraph breaks, I need to, I need a paragraph break to, like, breathe for a second. <laughs> but, um, so, yeah, I don't, so, paragraph breaks are out for me. No, are, no paragraph breaks are out. Okay, um, multi-generational sagas, and this is in. I love looking at the different generations of Especially if you're dealing with a situation where a character is a villain, like in a fantasy, a character is a villain, and you get to see the person that shaped them. Or you get to see the history of how they became the way they are. Or you get to look at your family. Or like, I love family stories. In fact, I feel like I don't read enough of stories about families, about dysfunctional families. I will watch it, you know, but I never, I don't read enough. So, like, I just recently bought Bridge of Clay, which I attempted once before, but I got it from the library. You guys know how I feel about long book, getting long books from the library. That usually ends up me getting me DNF the book because it's too long. Um, and then, you know, I'm currently reading Brothers Karamazov, which is sort of a... And, um, Robin Hobb's Seven Water series is kind of a multi-generation, is a multi-generational story. So I just think it's so cool to look at the different generations and compare and contrast them and see what shaped, in what shaped the person. Like, especially if they're kind of a villain, if they're a villain, like if you're dealing with a fantasy or sci-fi or something, you know, and you have, vil you have clear villains, like you can see who made them the way they are and realize, oh, this person, their parent is a lot worse. <laughs> Um, so this is in for me, multi-generational sagas. Okay, rereading is in for me. Although I do get a little, I do want to get some, before I reread, I want to get some other books. You know, I want to, like, it's a, basically it's a struggle for me. I like the idea of rereading and I want to do it. Um, but I also feel obligated to get some of my newer books the ones I haven't picked up yet, I want to read some of those first before I reread. But sometimes it gets to a point where you just, you just you're like, just go for it, just reread a book. Um, and there are a lot of books I do want to reread. I think I made a video about that. So rereading for me is in. Um, okay, and then artificial intelligence. I don't know, because again, this is another cool concept. 
you know, it's kind of cool to see a character that isn't, that's essentially a robot and them interacting with humans and observing us and trying to understand us and just someone who doesn't show emotion and just doesn't, like, can't feel anything and seeing them adapt to humanity. And I think it, the idea, one of the, like, I'm one of those people who did, who was somewhat into Star Trek, except for I didn't, I have never watched the original show, but I have watched a lot of Second Generation, and I've watched some of, um, Deep Space Nine, thanks to Terry, actually, and, um, I liked, and I remember, now I haven't watched the movies, but I do know in one of the movies, Dana gets, gets the ability to be emotion, have emotions, have feelings, and he falls for the villain, not realizing that she's a villain. And I think she breaks his heart, of course, because she's still a villain. And just his reaction to that is so heartbreaking, so heart-wrenching. And he just doesn't want to feel anything anymore. He wants the ability to feel emotions to be taken out. So I I think that is a really interesting concept. Where, like, I really enjoyed Defy the Stars. I want to say it's by Bridget Kemmerer. Um, but I'm not sure on that. I have to look it up. And I know it was a series, but I haven't read any of the other books. But I did enjoy that. And that one kind of also has the same concept where this AI, um, and this human girl interact for, I can't remember why they were brought together in the first place. And you see them start to develop feelings for each other, despite the fact he's a robot, technically. Um, and you see he kind of starts developing the ability to feel things and to care about someone. And like I said, I haven't watched the rest of the series. Um, or I haven't read the rest of the series. But this is one of those ones where I've, like, seen a lot of movies. But because I don't read sci-fi that much. Um. I don't, like, I don't read a lot of stories like that. that. So, in a way, it's when it comes to books, it's out. Because I would just rather watch it then read it but like i said i did like to fight the stars and i have thought about rereading the series like giving the series continuing with the series but i feel like i'm gonna have to reread defy the stars and i have seen one of the books at the library but only one of them and that really is frustrating when it comes to my library i know that they will have books from a series sometimes but they won't have the rest of the series and it's like why i mean although i think they have offered where you can get the book, they can order it from another library. So I have thought about doing that. Um, just to see if another library has it. I mean, like I said, I could look on Libby and see if Libby has it. But I don't know. Um, but I am curious about the rest of that series. But like I said, it's more on TV shows that I like it. Like, I love... Bicentennial Man in the movie AI starring Haley Joel Osment. So it's out in books for me. Not for the public. I feel like a lot, I feel, I don't feel like, I don't know if this is out for public, for the rest of the reading, the reading community. But for me, it's out. I would rather just watch it in a movie. Um, but who knows, that could change. But as of right now, it's out. As far as books. Okay, drop caps, and I believe from what Jennifer Brooks said, this is when they have the first letter as big and de decorative. Um, and I think I want to say that I have seen that in books before. I have seen that in books before. I don't know what book, but I think I have seen that in at least a, some book, a couple books here and there. I think I have seen it in more recent books. But I'm not 100% sure on that. It's, I don't remember. But I do agree with her. That is, uh, I like that idea. Especially with fantasy. I think that would be really cool. Or fantasy and historical. I think that would really be cool. Like, a book like this, I think it would be perfect. Um, okay, so I think this is the closest I've seen. This is right, um, right here. So it's not as fancy, but it's kind of, I think, what they're talking about, what a drop cap is. But I don't know. Um, but I also think it would be really great on a fantasy, especially, like, 
fantasy fantasies that are retelling of fairy tales, I would I think that would be perfect. Um but I don't know, maybe that costs money to do that or I don't know to make, you know, make it really pretty or like I like some of Naomi Novak's books like Uprooted or Spinning Silver. I think it'd be great to see that drop cap design. I think that would be cool in there. Um but yeah, I don't think I mean, but other than that, I've you know, so I think I to me this is in. I like this idea. But I don't see it. So I think publicly it's out, but for me personally, I like the idea. So I guess that would mean it's in for me. Um Happy Endings. Uh, so I'm gonna this is another one another time because there are a lot of these answers that I kinda I basically agree with Jennifer Brooks's answers. But um for this one I think like I said, I think I agree with her that it depends on the book. I think, like, a story that's kind of a fairy tale has to have mostly a happy ending, but it could potentially get away with having some sadder aspects in the ending. Like, a character, certain secondary characters could maybe die. Um, but mostly, I feel like, you know, in the romance novels, obviously they need to be happy endings too, I think. Um... And, like, you know, historical fiction, depending on the time what you're writing about with historical fiction, what time period, like, World War, if you're writing about World War II or something, then yeah, maybe that would make sense to have a, a sad or bittersweet ending. A Jane Austen novel is obviously going to have a happy ending. Um, and Jane Austen, if it's a Jane Austen inspired novel, then you've got to have, if it's Jane Austen inspired, then happy ending um if it's a book about like an epic war whether it's his actual history or like a fantasy situation then yeah it might need to be a sad ending like again like Jennifer Brooks says it depends on the book and the tone of the story but some don like some genres need to be I feel like should be ha have happy endings some I think they could get away with having sad endings um, so I think this could be like, this is, um, in and out because again, it depends on the book and the genre and the tone of the book. <sighs> okay. Um, plot points that only coverage converge at the end and I agree this is such a cool concept you know as you're trying to figure out what's going on I think it's a great way to get someone to keep reading a book unless they just don't like this at all um like if they absolutely hate where they have to wait until the end to see if everything see everything fit together because you're just as you're reading the books you're just spending the whole time wondering how is this gonna work this mystery like um I'm reading where's the book oh it's on my desk um, I'm reading Son of Shadows, and there were a couple of mysteries established in the beginning. It's not a mystery story, but there's a couple, there's a couple mysteries in the story of why, like, why certain people are the way they are, why they feel the way they feel, and I just kept having to read because I wanted to know why this was the way it is, why these characters reacted this way. Um... So I feel like it keeps you interested in the story. It keeps you intrigued and engaged because you just want to know. You want to piece it all together. And I kind of like that moment when every... And I love those moments when everything comes together. When you realize... And you're like, oh, that makes sense. And then when you reread the book or sometime, or rewatch if it's a movie or TV show, it's like you just... You see everything and you're just kind of like, oh, that's why. And that's why that make, that is that way. Or, oh, that makes sense. Or... Um, it just makes everything all the more clear, but it's just so fun when you don't know and you're slowly piecing it together. Um, and then the moment, the triumphant figure, figuring everything out, like the hints that are given throughout the story, you're like, okay, you know, you just keep reading it because you need to know. Now, I know some people probably don't, I mean, I don't know for sure, but I'm sure there are people that don't like it because they get so impatient. They, they don't just don't have the time to wait to find out. But, um, so this is in for me. I think this idea is really awesome. 
De detailed magic systems. This is one of the times that we don't, I don't agree with Jennifer Brooks. And it's funny what she brought up because I, admit, I do feel like magic can be like science. It's a different kind of science, I think. And which at the same time, I think I get bothered when sci-fi gets more credit over a fantasy and people are more, take sci-fi more seriously than the fantasy genre. And I think that's why, like, at first, it bothered, it bothered me when people say, oh, the, you know, what the Jedi do is actually magic. It's like, no, it's, that's not fantasy, that's sci-fi. But then over the years, of you know, realized, well, actually, yeah, the Star Wars is kind of more sci-fi fantasy. Um, but... I like complex magic systems and just it being um, detail magic systems. I think it's really cool. And I know that, yes, you could argue that it's more that that makes it more fantasy. I mean, I mean, more sci fi than fantasy. But I just think it's so fun. And like, I don't want every detail explained to me, but the like, there's, you know, it's not just random like um it doesn't just randomly happen you know but I also like soft magic systems where it's not really explained so this is in but I also like the softer ones you know the more traditional magic systems where there's no explanation but sometimes I get a little sometimes I can get frustrated with those because I want to know why <laughs> Um, so I guess in a way I'm kind of like Alice from Alice in Wonderland, where it's like, um, classic fantasy races. Um, I think if they're done in a new way, in a new unique way, then it's in. Like, classic, because you can't be a classic. You just gotta do, to make it more interesting and engaging, you gotta do something different with them. To keep people still into these classic creatures, you know, classic magical beings, like, um, you know, elves and witches and wizards and, um, you know, vampires and, oh, are vampires, would vampires be classic? I don't know. Vampires, werewolves, well, yeah, I guess they would, because they, they started in the 1800s, so, and, like, um, fairies, and if you do something unique with them, like, I think Sarah J. Mass did something really unique with hers, like, made them even more human, I feel like. She definitely did this whole new spin, and, you know, whether you like, I know a lot of people have issues with her, but she was there, it's, you know, she was very popular, and it's just like with Twilight, you may have issues with Twilight and see the flaws in Twilight, but you can't deny that it had, it really did, had an impact and really did something, you know, really had a powerful influence on people. Um, maybe more so teenage girls, but it's the same with, with, um, but that's how I feel like it is with Sarah J. Mass's books. And I gotta admit, I have been tough to check out her newest book, the, um, House of Blood, or, you know, Earth and Blood, or whatever. I have thought about it, but that's a long-ass book. Um, so, and yes, I have long, I am getting more into long-ass books, but I want to, you know, I gotta be really 100% excited about it, um, to commit to it. So, like, if they can, and I think they, she did something unique with her, with the Fae. And, um, I feel like, you know, like, you have classic fantasy characters, like, I think there's one, this one comic, series, graphic novel series called Elf Quest that's really cool. They did a cool thing with elves, made them a little more, first of all, mixed kind of sci-fi element with the elves. Like, make it imply that they're, they might be aliens from another planet who come down to Earth. And they kind of remind me a little bit of something that I always thought about when it came to elves, which is Native Americans. Like, elves are kind of like the Native Americans, so, you know... In their their bond with nature and living off the land and stuff, and um, they're very spiritual and I so I like what Elf Quest did with them as well. So I think if you can do something unique with them, there's a lot of orc books out there. I haven't read. I've attempted one of them, 
but I wasn't sure how I, but I didn't really, I wasn't really into it. Um, but I think, and like I said, if you can do something different with it, with these classic races and make them interesting, it could be in. Um, I don't think they're in completely in. I think they can be, you know, but yeah, if you're going to do something different with them, I, I'm saying it's in, it's in for me, classic characters. I mean, they're classic for a reason, so. Um, unreliable narrators. Again, another one that I don't read a lot of books like this, but I think, again, I think it does provide interesting ideas. Um, but by the sound of it, it can be overdone if you're not careful. So, you know, I think you need to do something that's a little different instead of, oh, she's an alcoholic. Um, I feel like they, I read about that, like, I don't read the books, but from what I, but I've heard, there's a, there are a lot of stories where, oh, a character is actually an alcoholic. Like, I feel like you can explore... I mean, I would love an unreliable narrator that's, that it's something different, like a different reason. Like, I don't know if you consider unreliable narrators that are narrators that come into a situation where they don't know what the heck is going on. And not that they're like, or you could do like a mental, reliable, unreliable narrator that isn't an alcoholic, but they do have mental health issues. Or something, you know, you can still do that without them being an alcoholic. You don't have to make them an alcoholic. So, I think unless they can do something different, it's out for me. Unreliable narrators. Unless they can do something different. Or, or another unreliable narrating tactic that they should try to do is maybe, and it kind of applies to another one on here. Um. Yeah, okay, yeah, so it's... At next next one so un I mean evil protagonist um so if you can do like I think an unreliable narrator could be a villain because villains always think they're the good guys they always think they're the heroes of their own stories and that everyone else is bad and I think that could be perceived as an unreliable narrator if you are from their perspective. So, of course, they'll think, they'll twist things and be like, act like they're the innocent victim, but then, surprise, they're actually a villain. Um, or they're becoming a villain. Then that would be a great unreliable narrator. So, as of right now, they're, I, I feel like they're overdone. But if you can do something different with it instead of just the whole, oh, they're an alcoholic. I mean, fantasy is... You can do so much with fantasy and do a very different versions of, of, of unreliable narrators in fantasy. Um, so, which, let me go ahead, go to number 16, which is, um, evil protagonist. Um, this is another one where, like, I agree with some of the points that Jennifer Brooks made, which is, if they're straight up evil, then that's, to me, that's unrealistic and it's too cartoonish. I need an unreal, uh, evil protagonist that has some layers to them to be an unreliable, unreal, a evil protagonist that's layered. <laughs> As they say, ogres have layers. Um, I think they need to have layers. They can't just be straight up evil. And I also, and again, another thing that Jennifer Brooks said that I agree with is that the whole idea of maybe it's a villain origin story. That is a cool... And that goes back to... That's another way you can have an unreliable protagonist. Like, this could be their origin story. Of how they became evil. And so they end up being an unreliable narrator. Or, like, another one that you could use for unreliable narrator is someone who's... Um, they aren't necessarily a villain. They're not a bad guy, but they're... They're a bit of a charming rogue. There's someone you can't 100% trust and they might exaggerate their stories. You know, like Quope in The Name of the Wind. Um, you could argue that he's an unreliable narrator. Although I think a lot of people, like I just watched, I didn't watch the whole thing, but I watched Jay from Captain Words and his girlfriend were talking about it. And they were saying for them personally that he's not an unreliable narrator. He just exaggerates things. Um, so I don't know, but that's the best, that's just another, I feel like that's a, 
could still be another example of how you could really do an unreliable narrator. But anyway, back to evil protagonist. So I think if you show their origin story, or like maybe, you know, you could consider like there's characters, there's shows I watched where I would love to see that a character that started out as a villain, character that is a, started out as a villain, you could see their, if they were the protagonist. Because a protagonist, as someone pointed out um, in a YouTube comment on another video, and protagonist isn't necessarily a good person. They're not always a hero. They're just, it's their story. They're not like this, you know. So, a protagonist is necessarily, it's just they're the main character and it's their story, but it doesn't necessarily mean they become a good guy. Um, so, I think this is in if you can do it right. If you can make them interesting and not just straight up evil. Okay, the chosen one, um, protagonist, I mean, the chosen one, uh, this is out for me, I, I, this is kind of boring after a while because, you know, I, I mean, it can still be fun, and, like, I'm still reading books where there's a chosen one, like, I'm reading the Wheel of Time series and I'm still having fun with it and enjoying it, so just because this is out doesn't mean I'm not interested in stories that happen to have this, um, and the way, and, you know, um, now, if they could do, again, this is another one where if they could do something different with it, then maybe it'll be more in for me. Um, or, like, I think the concept, and I, there might be a book out there about this, where you think a character is the chosen one, and then it turns out, oh, actually, they're not. We just thought they were. Um, or I like what they did in Mistborn in the first book, The Final Empire, where he was like, you had a chosen one, but they screwed up, and the bad guy won. Or, like, um, you know, in Star Wars, the prequels, they had, you know, you know, um, Obi-Wan was, like, talking to, um, you know, was just saying, saying that, um, Anakin was supposed to be the chosen one, but then he screwed up and become all evil, and he gets taken over by the... Um, brainwashed by the Sith. So I, like, um, so if you could do something different with the Chosen One, I want to see more stories like that where someone who's a Chosen One, and of course, as I always say, I do agree that maybe instead of just talking about I should write about it if I want to. <laughs> um, so maybe one day I will. Okay, so, yeah, it's out unless they do something different. When the protagonist dies in the end, and I have mixed opinions about this because I don't want the protagonist to always, I don't want, I don't know if I want it, but maybe it could work for the story and it would really show a sacrifice. But I think you can also sacrifice your, you know, make a sacrifice without having to kill the character off. There could be other ways to sacrifice the character, like, um... You know, um, so I don't know. I, I kind of, I think this is kind of out for me. I don't want my protagonist to die unless it just works for the tone of the story where the character sacrifices, the protagonist sacrifices himself in a big way. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's really hard in TV shows because sometimes if it's a beloved character, you know, you don't want them to die. So, I, I just, I don't know. I mean, I feel like, although there's some situations where I think maybe it's necessary to kill off a character, to kill off the protagonist. Um, so, I think it, it's just hard because I, I feel like it's out, but then, I don't know. Sometimes I think it could work. Um... So, it's kind of in and out for me, this one. Oh, some of these are still kind of hard because it's like, you know, I, like, I don't know if it's in or out for me. Okay, so next we have really long chapters. Out. Hate long chapters, super long chapters. 
I need them to not be so, but I, I mean, it would be nice for them to be longer than a few, than like a page or two. I mean, but I can understand where that benefits, like books are like thrillers and stuff, like James Patterson, even though I don't, I don't read him anymore. I do not like him. I have issues with him. Um, which I, which makes me, I'm mildly curious if Run, Rose, Run has short chapters. Because, like I said, James Patterson is one of those, you know, he does write short chapters. But, um, but, I, I don't know. I think this is out for me. I, I don't like short chapters. That, I get impatient with short chapters, with long, not short chapters. I don't like, it's, long chapters are out for me. I get very impatient with long chapters. Um... So, yeah, this is out. Can't, can't do long chapters. Don't like it. Um, French traps. Fr French flaps. I like French flaps. Um, so this is in for me. I, I, really, I like the design. And also, and then the next one is deckled edges. I like that too. I understand why people don't like them, but I like it. I like the aesthetic of it, of French flaps and the deckled edges. I think that's really cool. It makes it look really old fashioned. Um, so these are both in for me. Signed copies by the author. I don't know if this is controversial or not, but this is out for me. I mean, if it's an author that I really, really love, then maybe, but I don't have any special, like, desire to go to look for, to get an author to sign my book. I mean, I mean, I might, I don't know, I mean, because I like autographs, so I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I can really say it's out. I, I think it is, but it's just, I, I never get them, so I don't have any special attachment to it. The one time I did get a signed copy, I did think it was really cool, but then I ended up donating the book anyway. And that was, um, finale was assigned, had, was signed by, um, is, is it no, what is, is it Stephanie Arbor? Sorry, I'm drawing a blank of who wrote the Caraval series. I mean, I just re read her new one, Once Upon a, Once Upon a, Um, once upon a, um, I can't think of what that one's called. The title of that one. Once upon a broken heart. I, I just read that. Was is it Stephanie Garber? Yeah, I think it's Stephanie Garber. Yeah, I I had a signed copy for a book, but I ended up just getting rid of it because I don't have any. I mean, there's certain ones like, you know, like even though I'm not a hardcore fan of Lord of the Rings, I think. A signed copy of Lawrence Frank's books would be kind of cool. And I do have a signed copy of Robert Jordan's book. But I might just... I've debated about donating that one. Because I guess I kind of do... So maybe it's not entirely out for me. Because it, it's a it's cool. But then it's like... What if you decide you're no longer interested in that book? And I think that could happen. I mean, granted, maybe that's just me. Maybe it could only happen to me. But... um, So I don't know. If this is in or out. I think, you know, I think it depends. I think it depends on the author. Um, so, as at the moment, I'm saying it's out. Um, dog gearing is in. I don't have a problem with dog gearing my books. I don't use them to mark the page, necessarily, unless... I only mark... I only dog gear when I'm trying to... When I want to show how much... I need to read to get to the next part or um I want to remember to the quote or something like especially like lately I've been dogging pages just to because I don't want to like it's kind of hard when to underline and highlight when you're not you know you don't have a desk type surface in front of you and you're just sitting in a chair it's kind of hard to you know dog gear in that situation I mean it's kind of hard to mark up your book because like or when I'm traveling and sometimes I just don't feel like doing anything right I just want to read 
and um, I don't want to, you know, be like, okay, I got to stop and mark this because I like this. Um, so sometimes I dog, so I have nothing against dog gear. And I know, you know, I do have bookmarks because I do use them. And I don't dog gear pages to, you know, mark my place. Um, I dog gear them to, you know, mark that a um, lot, like, so that I can remember that, come back to that page. Um, or like, but that's it. So I don't have a problem with dog gearing. I know a lot of readers consider, a lot of readers consider that a crime, but you know, it's, it's not, to me, it's not a big deal. So this is in for me. Okay. So this is the last one. Chapter titles instead of numbers. I don't care. I don't care about this one. Um, I think it's cool to have chapter, title, chapter titles, especially if they have a really good one, like a really charming one. Um, or, you know, I know that Dickens has a lot of his books, they have chapter title, his early works, I think, have chapter titles, and they're often kind of ways to explain what's going on in the chapter. Um, and sometimes they can be really long, like a little par a little mini paragraph, of like three sentences. Like, you don't need to do that. Um, but I don't care, I'm just... You know, for me, this one, I don't really care. I don't care if it's in or out, you know, to me, it's not, I mean, I don't know if other people like it, you know, how other people feel about it, but I personally just don't care. Like, if you want to put titles, I think titles can be fun, you know, and sometimes you can just put the character name so that, you know, and it's an, a cheat way to separate, to show, oh, we're in another character's head right now, if it's a, um... Like, in Game of Thrones, that's what um, George R. R. Martin does. He just, he puts the title, the character's name, the top, the main character in that chapter. He puts it on the top, their name on there. So, it's a cheat way to tell people we're with a different character now. Um, but, yeah, I personally, I just don't care. I don't care if you want, if you want to do that, that's fine. If you don't want to do it and you prefer numbers, that's fine, too. Um, but anyway, so that is the in or out book tag. Um, feel free to do, consider yourself tagged and do this one if you want. It could be kind of, it's kind of, again, another one that's kind of fun. Um, you can, and it also opens for discussion. Um, if you like this video, be sure to give a thumbs up. Click subscribe if you haven't already. Click the bell notification below if you want to be notified when I post new videos. If you are staying safe happy and healthy and enjoying your reading. All right, bye.